This is Guam. Less than 1,600 miles from Tokyo and Manila, the largest of the Mariana Islands was still a vital guardian of Japan's sea lanes in the summer of 1944. When Saipan fell, Guam was next on our schedule of attack. Guam had been the first American possession to fall to the Japanese. Now, two and a half years later, our convoys were steaming toward the Japs' Mariana stronghold in preparation of its capture. And meanwhile, we shelled and bombed Guam's coastal installations. Because the original invasion date, June 16th, had to be postponed, our first premature barrage had been kept up continuously for 17 days, the longest pre-invasion bombardment to occur in this theater. Our aircraft came to bomb and strafe the Jap positions. They dropped 400 tons of explosives and in their strafing runs fired several hundred thousand rounds of ammunition. The invasion plan called for two simultaneous assaults, north and south of Opera Harbor, one by the 3rd Marine Division, the other by the 1st Provisional Marine Brigade, reinforced by the 77th Infantry Division. D-Day was set for 21st July. At 8 o'clock that morning, men of the 1st Provisional Marine Brigade and later of the 77th Infantry prepared to land in the southern sector after a final two hours pounding of Guam's west coast. They were expecting rough going. They knew that the island shores were studded with coral reef, that Guam was powerfully fortified, and that at all costs the Japs would try to hold on. But by early afternoon, Major General Bruce, commander of the 77th Infantry Division, was ready to move his troops inland. The landings were almost unopposed. So successful had been the pre-invasion bombardment. And in the northern sector, the 3rd Marine Division invaded. At 8.20, the first troops landed. Then, 15 minutes later, the Japs attacked with mortar fire. They struck some amphibian tanks, but they didn't damage a single transport, nor did they hold up our schedule. Our naval guns thundered in reply. Nineteen warships fired a stream of shells right over the assault waves. Some men had to wade ashore from stranded amphibians. On land, because of Jap artillery, Marines had to dig in and wait until some hours later the enemy concentrations were destroyed by air attacks. Then the Marines moved on through charred and tattered palm groves. After 10,000 tons of bombs and shells, the enemy still had guns and fight. And here in jungles, swamps, and mountain caves, he was going to make his stand. By early evening, the men had crossed the Assam River and reached their first objective. The day was over, but the mortar fire went on. This was Friday night the beginning of a furious weekend in the Central Pacific. Now that two beachheads were firmly established, our next objectives were a juncture of forces and the control of Opera Harbor. The 3rd Marines were to move down, capturing Piti and Cabras Island, the harbor's northern border. The 1st Provisional Marines were to move up toward Arote Peninsula, the southern border. But first, on Saturday at dawn, Jap troops counterattacked from the Chonito Cliffs. Our tanks and buffaloes, as well as naval and aerial gunfire, supported our troops who beat them back, though they had driven far into our outposts. And while the Japs resisted savagely from caves along the cliff, another contingent of the 3rd Marines fought their way southward. Our troops and infantry tank teams were supported by mortar fire from the rear, and by Sunday morning had reached both Cabras Island and Piti. There they found more evidence of the furor of our 17-day bombardment. This was all it had left of Piti town, and our troops and mortars had done the rest. No building, no natives, no Japs. In the south, one section of the troops were pushing north, while another on Saturday had started a drive east toward Mount Alifan. 
To protect their advance across an open plain, machine guns first sprayed the area. Fortunately, Japanese resistance was weak. By Sunday night, Mount Alifan was ours. On the following day, the troops going north reached the base of Orote Peninsula, and on Tuesday, they established contact with the northern forces. A 12-mile coastline was now consolidated as we prepared for the next day's attack on the last Japanese stronghold on this coast, Orote. For some, the fighting was over. 2,366 men had been wounded, and for every five Japs killed, one American had died. 443 in all, and 109 were missing. The seriously wounded were on their way to a hospital ship. For others, the worst was still to come. Howitzers were set up at the peninsula's base, and as a precaution against surprise attacks, Trenches were dug where the troops waited for the signal to attack. Wednesday morning, shortly before the jump-off point at 0700 hours, aerial attacks and naval fire hit at the strongly defended Jap mortar and artillery positions. The attack went on for three whole days. With machine gun fire, the Marines broke through the Japs' forward defenses, fought their way through dense jungle undergrowth against desperate resistance and finally blasted the Japs out of their dugouts with dynamite packs and hand grenades. On Saturday, eight days after the invasion, Orote's airfield was ours. The U.S. Marines had returned to a base where their own barracks had stood before Pearl Harbor, and which by their own guns had now been reduced to this. We controlled our coastline now, Mount Tanyo and Mount Alifan. Next came the capture of Guam's capital, Aganya. The attack was set for Monday, the 31st, D-Day plus 10. The 3rd Marines and 77th Infantry Division moved abreast. There was little resistance. The Japs had retreated and in the process set up roadblocks and barbed wire in Aganya's outskirts. These barriers were ineffective. Even landmines did not hold us up for long. By 6 o'clock in the afternoon, we had entered the capital. 11,000 Shamaros, amiable, sleepy native Guamanians had lived here before the war. Long ago they had been seized by the Japs or had fled to the hills. And now, save for an isolated Jap sniper, Aganya's ruins were utterly deserted. At the same time, troops headed for Pago Bay on the east coast to split the island in two. Resistance was weak, but the mountain terrain was tough. There was no time to build roads, and the men had to carry much of the artillery ammunition themselves. Brigadier General Noble of the 3rd Marine Division watching the troops' progress at a forward command post. Reconnaissance patrols set out to probe the area south of the splitting line. To their surprise, they found no sign of the Japs. The enemy had evacuated his troops to the north and proposed to defend the island from there. All the patrols found in that region were the bodies of Guamanian natives, bodies without heads. For each time a native had turned his head toward the sky and looked for our liberating airplanes, the Japs in their hysteria had decapitated him. Now our task was to squeeze the Japs toward the northern tip of Guam. On August 6th, the third week of the invasion, one flank of the 77th started its drive toward Mount Santa Rosa. At the base of the mountain, our artillery hammered at the entrenched Japs before more troops were able to move up. On the other side of the island, the 3rd Marine Division had driven northeast from Aganya toward another airfield. Again, they encountered little opposition, and on the 2nd of August, two days after our entry into the capital, the airfield's capture was complete. These planes might have killed hundreds of our men. Thanks to our thorough bombardment, they never had a chance to take off. Communication lines were quickly thrown forward while the field itself was being reconstructed by Seabees. Before long, we were launching aerial assaults on other Mariana Islands as well as Guam itself. The Marines swept on northwestwards to Finigayon. Here and there, a sniper might be left, but otherwise the village was as empty as had been P.T., Cabras Island, and Aganya. 
The troops in the east kept up with this fast northward push. They were now making for Pati Point, the island's very tip. This was the last stretch. Guam had been the first South Sea Island to be visited by a white man, and since 1898 had been in American hands. Now, after the years of devastating Jap occupation, it would once more belong to us in a few more days. But first the fighting became fiercer. All the surviving Japs had been driven to this small corner in the north, from where they were determined to resist to the last man rather than surrender. The push went on and on. This jungle-infested island, a tiny speck on the map, is in reality the size of San Francisco. Quickly as our troops had overrun Guam, it wasn't an easy job. We had to flush out the last desperate Japs who had stubbornly dug themselves into huge caves near Pati Point. In one cave alone, we found between three and four hundred charred Japanese. This was the end. On 10th August, exactly three weeks after D-Day, all organized resistance ceased. More than 22,000 civilian natives had found refuge with the American troops. They were given medical aid before returning to their homes and farms. The natives had suffered greatly under our attack, but they welcomed us as liberators and presented us with an American flag, which, made by their own hands, had come from their hearts. We paid our price. This man no longer had a face which would identify him. We had to bury 1,289 American men. 5,648 were wounded. 148 were missing. The Japs had lost more than 10,000. But we were now almost three quarters of the way to Tokyo. The first American possession to be taken by the Japanese had become our first great air and naval base, far out in the Pacific a new Pearl Harbor, 4,000 miles closer to the war, from which to launch our flying fortresses against the homeland of the enemy. 